we're going to look at Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15. Verse, 15, uh, verse 16, excuse me. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 16. So we're going through the seven vials over here. One, and then two, third vial, fourth vial, fifth vial, sixth vial, and then seven. Now we're still at number six. So remember, the sixth vial is referring to drying up of the Euphrates River so that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And those kings of the east was referring to the Orient, to China. And remember, the Antichrist was, is going to have some problems at China and then the theory, I mentioned to you, the theory goes is that he's going to get that back in order and they're going to rejoin him as the UN to try to battle against God at Armageddon. So Armageddon, for some of you who don't know, is referring to Christ's second coming as he comes down and does a bloody battle against the Antichrist army, and the blood is so high that it reaches to the hem of his garments, actually. It's like a wine press of the wrath of God. And that was covered, I explained those verses to you, at Revelation chapter 15, the previous uh, chapter, uh, chapter 14, excuse me, Revelation 14, about the wine press. It is represented as the wine press of God's wrath. Why? Because the world has been worshiping the Antichrist, received his mark, blasphemed God, and not only that, it's recording the past 2,000 years of history where the world has rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that, his wrath uh, is piled up so high that this battle will take place in this area called Armageddon. That's why the name is given. The name Armageddon is given to God's wrath because that's the area where the people, the armies will meet Jesus and he will battle with them. So it is important to realize as a person who's studying the book of Revelation that when you look at the map in Israel concerning Armageddon, you're going to notice, wow, that's uh, what a place. Well, that's the place exactly where Jesus Christ is going to wipe out the armies. Amen. Look at Revelation 16, verse 16. And he gathered them together. So notice over here that the armies are being gathered. Now it says he gathered them together, right? Mm -hmm. Now if you go back in your text over here, at verse 14, notice the spirits of devils gather the people. But you'll notice at verse 16, the beginning, he gathered them together. So why? Because the Lord is using the devil to gather up his minions so that he can wipe them all out. Amen. You got to realize that when Satan does his satanic, demonic actions, he cannot do it without asking God's permission first. Amen. And that's why you got to look at the book, the book of Job chapter 1 and chapter 2. So Satan cannot perform his demonic function unless the Lord lets him, allows him. That's why the, whenever Satan's going to do something, you'll see God's hand can be behind it. Okay. God gathered them together. He gathered them together uh, into a place. What's this location and place? Called in the Hebrew tongue. So it's in the Hebrew language, Armageddon. This is Hebrew. So that's the Hebrew root word. Being a Hebrew tongue, we then know that this is going to take place in Israel, the land of the Hebrews. The land of the Hebrews. So this will take place in Israel. That's where the action is. I mean, even today, if you look at our world, where's all the uh, action on news and current events focusing on? 
What's going on with Israel? What is going on with Israel? That's where all the action is, even in current events. So we're, in these current events, we're at the edge of prophecy over here, the edge of the tribulation. We're close. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. All right, so there's a, a seventh angel that's pouring out the seventh vial into the air up here. And when he pours out his vial in the air up here, then what happens? Judgment starts to fall out of the air. And we've seen that throughout the past. We've seen that throughout the past six vials. Remember, one angel pours out the vial into the air and then judgment falls. The second angel does it likewise. The third angel to the, to the air, the fourth, and so on and so forth. So we see, this, uh, we see this occurring. And what's the seventh judgment now? And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven. So a voice out of the temple in heaven occurs. Now remember, where is God's temple? It is up here in heaven. It is up in heaven. So heaven, which is obviously above the air, and you might recall that when God started to voice out of the temple, that's when his judgments started to fall. We saw that at Revelation 15, correct? So these vials, these judgments are going to be tied to his temple worship, temple service. Now, isn't it amazing that during temple worship and temple service that there is judgment? Mm. It's not about being feeling good and something positive. It's something judge, ju God considers judgment as his worship service. That's good. And we saw that in Revelation 15. Out of the altar, out of the temple is what? His judgments. So when we sing hymns, actually there, there are hymns that actually boast about God's judgment. But a lot of the hymn writers start to take, take those things out. So there are hymns, believe it or not, that talks about our God being terrible, about God burning Babylon. I mean, those kind of songs are actually being rejoiced and worshiping God. But where are those songs? We, uh, we don't sing those songs. We hardly sing those hymns. Out of the temple comes out a great voice. Why? Because remember, God, God is being worshipped in there. That's the idea. God is being worshipped in there. You also notice that he mentions about out of the throne as well, not just out of the temple. So what you can suspect then is that God's throne is inside the temple then. That's why it makes so much sense that the Old Testament tabernacle is patterned after what? The heavens, where God's throne, which is considered the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, is deep inside his temple, his home over there. So, so God is in there. Out of it comes out a voice. Uh, let's see. Great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne. See that? So the throne is inside there saying what? It is done. So God is speaking. God is speaking, it is done. Why? Because uh, when God talks about it is done, that means the end is here. That's right. The end. The tribulation is about to reach its end, and God is about to receive his glory and set up his kingdom. His judgment during the tribulation is pretty much over. That's why it's in the seventh. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. So notice that when the seventh vial is poured out, it's not just the voice up in heaven, but there are voices. Now, pay attention to this part. Notice that over here, that there are voices. Uh, instead of writing it over here, I'm going to write it here. And then notice that what follows it, this is important, thunders. Notice what also follows it is lightning. Why is that important, Pastor? Because 
Whenever God speaks, what is very interesting is that thunder and lightning is associated with it. So when, you, uh, when God utters his voice, his voice is so magnificent and powerful that thunder and lightning will come out of it. But notice also it says voice says. Did you notice that? Yep. Voices, not just one voice. Remember Revelation chapter 5, there were many voices up there. And that's referring to the celestial beings. They could be the 24 elders, they could be the angels, they could be the seraphim cherubim, I don't know, or it could be all of them. But the point is, is that they are heavenly beings. Then what is very interesting is that when people utter their voices up in heaven, it is actually so powerful and dreadful that it's going to accompany with thunder and lightning, which makes a lot of sense when you read the book of Exodus, the Jews could not hear God when he was speaking to them. Why? Because the thunder and lightning was so dreadful. Yeah. That's the reason why people cannot directly meet God face to face. Right. If they directly went God face to face, they would drop dead yep. because it's so powerful, dreadful, and terrible. Imagine these people then at Armageddon. Do you think they, they can withstand our presence? No. no. They can't. God will use his rapture voice to call us up before the tribulation. We know that, right? Well, if that is the case where the church is raptured up before the tribulation, you've got to also remember that if his voice is going to utter, then there could be lightnings and thunder as well. That's something also to think about. That's why when we get raptured up to he heaven, the people who are not God's sheep will not recognize his voice, but the sheep will hear his voice. To those who don't recognize the voice of God, they're going to see it as thunder, they're going to see it as lightning, or they're even going to think with their advanced technology, this is something alien. An angel spoke to him. Now, all these things and these verses were already explained at my Revelation chapter 5 study, so I'm not going to expound it over here. But the point is, is that voices, thunders, and lightnings, uh, it might be very uh, useful to think about it as you read throughout the Bible. You might see some more connections. And there was a great earthquake. So, uh, so there's a great earthquake. That's his judgment. So the judgment of the seventh vial is a great earthquake. A lot of people think that well, you know, the earthquakes that are happening now, are we in the tribulation? Well, obviously not, because these other six vials did not occur. The Euphrates River did not dried up for the kings of the east. We didn't go through water turning into blood and et cetera, et cetera, with all the other vials. So it's a great earthquake. Throughout this great earthquake, you know what falls? Babylon. So that is the judgment of Babylon. It will occur at the seventh vial. That's the reason why there is a theory out there concerning about Babylon could fall at the... Now, this is an interesting theory. They teach that the Antichrist during the first three and a half years, because he's the Pope, he'll be at Rome. And then when Babylon burns to the ground, he's going to move his headquarters to Jerusalem at the temple, which is a very interesting theory. But that theory does not seem to work because what it really looks like is that, remember, the seventh vials are what? They are at the end of the tribulation. We're past the mid or post-tribulation rapture. And because we're reaching at the end, this is the timeline where Babylon falls. So because Babylon is falling during this seventh vial, so I'm going to put a line over here. That way people can see that this is all referring to the seventh vial here, all of this. So all of what's occurring here is going to happen with the seventh vial, excluding, obviously, Armageddon, where it's connected with the six. Now, keep reading. Great earthquake such as not, was not since men were upon the earth. So 
This is an earthquake that is bigger than all the earthquakes that you're scared about today. You think that the earthquake's going on today, man, this is horrifying. We're uh, is, are we at the tribulation? No, this, was, this is supposed to be an earthquake that has never been experienced throughout all of history. So mighty an earthquake, it's so mighty and so great, it's such a big earthquake that it would do what? It would do this, verse 19, and the great city was divided into three parts. What is this great city? A lot of people might think, well, isn't that great city referring to Jerusalem? No, this great city would actually refer to Babylon in the same passage at verse 9, 19. The great city was divided into three parts. So it divides into one, two, three. That's how big the earthquake is. It splits the city into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. This is such a big earthquake that it just... It does not only affect the city of Babylon into three parts, but all the surrounding cities are getting affected as well. They start to fall apart. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God. So uh, God remembers the, the wickedness of Babylon, which is why he poured out that judgment. To give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So that great earthquake is considered to be his wrath. It's considered to be his wrath where he's, uh, and it's using the metaphor, the cup of the wine, the cup of the wine of the wrath. Now remember, Armageddon at Revelation 14, I mentioned it is known as God's wrath. Why? Because the blood is like grape juice, so to speak. It will pour out so much like grape juice. That's the reason why the Lord will quite often put the wrath in the metaphor of a cup. And the cup of wine will always accompany blood. You're going to notice that. As it talks about grape juice, it's going to symbolize blood. That's the reason why it makes so much sense when we take the Lord's Supper, it's symbolizing, it's representing His blood. So when God talks about His wrath, it's important to understand this metaphor that will be used. The metaphor that will be used is always a cup, a cup, a cup, that is wine, grape juice, and that will be known as His wrath. So notice over here that there's different wraths. So post-tribulation, people who believe that we will go through the tribulation, the church will go through the tribulation, and the wrath is at the end, they talk about that there is only one wrath, but you'll notice over here that there are different wraths. So if we already see different wraths, even at a post-tribulation, even at a near and tribulation timeline, what makes you doubt so many other wraths that have occurred before? So this is evidence that there, are, there is undoubtedly multiple wraths, not just one wrath. Why? Because even for pre-wrathers and post-tribulation people, their own wrath has multiple wraths in it. So that is undeniable. Remember, pre-wrath and post-tribulation people believe that the church will go through the tribulation Hence, post-tribulation and pre-wrath because the church will be raptured before God's wrath occurs. Now let's return to Revelation chapter 16. Uh, people who doubt me on this teaching, I know people always bring that criticism up whenever I talk about a pre-tribulation rapture. Please watch the video, Chronology of the Apocalypse, before you throw in a comment, okay? I've said that so many times, just watch the video, but it shows right here and it makes me wonder if you're very fleshly that you don't want to study the Bible. That shows you're fleshly, and if you're fleshly, that explains why you would heed to wrong doctrine. And be, if you heed to wrong doctrine, and that it turns out to be post-tribulation, pre-wrath uh, doctrine for the church, then that doctrine is a fleshly doctrine, you got to realize. So those doctrine appeal to the sins of the flesh. 
If you want to prove me wrong on that, then watch Chronology of the Apocalypse then, okay? Amen. Prove me wrong, watch that video, and study before you get upset and throw in a comment. All right, let's uh, return over here. Now, remember, your pastor is just speaking plain truth, and he is very exhausted where he tries to show the truth, and people don't even look and study the Bible. We live in a very sensitive generation, and I hope that people are mature enough not to fall into that. Okay, so I hope you understand the reason why I talk this way.